So there was a couple of interesting things about this virus. First of all, you want to talk about the viral backbone. So kind of the crux of the virus. The only lab in the world that has a virus that looks that is like, I believe like 93% genetically similar to SARS-CoV-2 was this bat that came from a cave, a Yunnan cave um, discovered by the Wuhan Institute of Virology years earlier. And they have published on that. But from there, there were a couple of other things that didn't match that. And so how did that come? How did that come to be? And usually it's because there's mixing of species. You have bats with other animals and so forth and then to humans. But there was something called the receptor binding motif. And that's essentially how does the virus attach to the cell to invade it and to then infect? Well, that um, binding motif was very specific, and they did locate one very specific to that in a pangolin, which is like an anteater type of animal. And so they're thinking, okay, maybe the bats and the pangolins got together, and now we're really close to what SARS-CoV-2. But there was still one more mutation that needed to exist. And that was, you know, something that's become very controversial. And I'm not a virologist. I studied microbiology before medical school and immunology, but I'm not a virologist. But I tried to um, explain it the best I could in the book. This one cleavage site is what really has this mutation has made this virus to be so transmissible and can cause such severe disease. And also, causes the um, involvement of the central nervous system, which is why people say they can't smell or they can't taste anything when they're infected. Well, what's interesting about that is that specific mutation is known to be a virulent mutation, one that would make a virus to be much more dangerous. Um, We've seen it in the worst influenza viruses. We've seen it in many other viruses. And that can happen in nature, undoubtedly. It can happen in nature. But at that specific lab, they have published data that they were actually introducing furin cleavage sites, those mutations into certain coronaviruses to kind of test their virulence. And so when we talk about gain of function research, that's what that is. They're essentially giving a virus different functions to see what it would do. They've published on that data. It's not like we're we're having some cloak and dagger operation or trying to determine what they're doing in there. They publish on it, so we know it's public knowledge. They were inserting those mutations. So again, could this all happen in nature? Absolutely. Could it have happened in a lab? Sure. It needs to be investigated. And before we continue, I wanted to invite everyone to subscribe to Epoch TV. That's where you can get all of our exclusive content, including our new documentary, DeSantis, Florida versus Lockdowns, and a whole suite of other exclusive content. That's at epochtv.com ATL. You know, when it comes to the Chinese Communist Party, we've been looking at the Chinese Communist Party for 20 years at the Epoch Times. Everything is highly politicized, right? So you, 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 you assume that that's part of, going to be part of the answer to the question. So one of the uh, things that you note in there is that, that the virus, all the samples of the virus at the Wuhan lab or samples of virus at the Wuhan lab were destroyed early on. Well, there are a couple of things that people still aren't talking about, which I'm just kind of waiting for them to talk about. I mean, they're in the book, so maybe they will at some point. Uh, You mentioned that the viral samples were destroyed, not just the viral samples in the lab. Viral samples from the hospitals were destroyed. And that was their way of saying we want them destroyed so they don't infect anybody else. But that's not really how public health works. Uh, We actually like to keep samples so that we can study it and create treatments and potential vaccines for it. And then if you remember very early on, the mantra was that the Chinese Communist Party is being much more forthcoming this time around. If you remember with the original SARS outbreak, they weren't forthcoming giving the genetic sequence. They're really keeping things close to the vest. But yes, they did put forth that um, the genetic sequence, which a couple of days later is when the mRNA vaccine started being made. It was pretty incredible. But if you really looked into why they had to release that information, it was they were strong armed to do that. And that's because another lab, and of course I'm drawing a blank on the name of the gentleman there, but the head scientist there had gotten a hold of samples from the hospital and he sequenced the virus. And he sent that sequence. He knew he couldn't publish it himself because he, uh, the Chinese Communist Party would likely see it and shut him down. So he sent that sequence to a friend of his in Australia. And he, he then put it on a public platform for all to see. 
the sequence of this virus. Well, uh, essentially, the Chinese Communist Party did find that. They shut the lab down for rectification, whatever that means, uh, pulled the sequence off the internet, and then the Wuhan Institute of Virology the next day published the sequence like the heroes of the pandemic. It's like, what they actually weren't the first people to do that. But it just is par for the course for what goes on um, there. It seems. Well, yeah, and, and rectification obviously means that someone had done, you know, committed an egregious anti-party sin and needs to be, you know, re rectified, so to speak. So I'll, I'll help decode that for everyone watching. Yeah, it's it, you mean I mean you can't write this stuff, right? Initially, China or via the Chinese Communist Party uh, basically uh, hid the fact that there was human transmission. We know that as a fact now uh, of the pandemic. At the same time, it influenced the WHO, um, or at least, and, and you argue uh, that as well. So tell me a little bit about this kind of hiding of the, of the transmissibility and the sort of the complicity of other organizations, I think even in the US perhaps. Well, you know, it's interesting. So China has the largest pandemic surveillance program uh, in place. They also have the largest coronavirus surveillance program in place, and yet nothing stopped this from happening. Uh, the alarm wasn't sounded for a potential um, epidemic or local outbreak. None of this occurred. You had some very brave Chinese whistleblower physicians who were alerting uh, colleagues, friends on some of their local platforms but you didn't really hear anything from the government until weeks later. Um, and you kept hearing, yes, there were starting to be clusters of cases in family members and coworkers. That's a very early indication that there's human to human spread. And then you started seeing healthcare workers falling ill, but there still wasn't being, there was no warning that there was a human to human spread going on. Thank goodness you have Taiwan and Korea and others who had systemic memory from a less than forthcoming China from the original SARS. They weren't listening to what was going on. They shut down flights. They started screening all of the passengers. This was way before they even acknowledged there was human to human transmission going on. The United States was l essentially listening to them and we were echoing everything that was coming out of there. Oh, there's no human to human spread. It seems like a local outbreak at this wet market. It is what it is. It's gonna be fine. They've got it under control. The World Health Organization was echoing everything that was coming out of China. They did not go in and do their own investigation. They did not see the fact that you had people lined up outside of hospitals waiting to go in. They did not see the urns being stacked outside of the funeral homes. They were only taking uh, the CCP at their word for it. And it wasn't until things got out of control and cases were being seen outside of China that you they actually acknowledged that there was sustained human to human transmission. Imagine if we had that information a month earlier. Imagine if China actually acknowledged it and shut down travel. They shut down travel from Wuhan to other provinces in China, but they allowed people to leave Wuhan to go elsewhere throughout the world. Uh, imagine if they had shut travel down a month earlier and did not allow people to leave anywhere, the world may have been saved from this pandemic. But China decided to only protect those within China and allowed this virus to go all across the world during the Chinese New Year, which is the largest global human migration that we have. Hey, thanks for watching American Thought Leaders. As you're probably well aware, big tech has been censoring a lot of content on its platforms, including some American Thought Leaders episodes, including some other Epoch Times content. Now, to deal with this, we've actually launched a new video platform, Epoch TV. Epoch TV is our premium platform for digital video content. It's got American Thought Leaders. It's got Facts Matter with Roman Balmakov, The Larry Elder Show, Crossroads with Joshua Phillip. And frankly, this is our contribution, if you will, to the uncensored media landscape, which is something we really, really need in this country and around the world, frankly. To subscribe, epochtv.com slash ATL. Go to epochtv.com slash ATL or hit the link below.